This hospital is one of the many for the care and treatment of the psychoneurotic soldier. These are the casualties of the spirit, the troubled in mind, men who are damaged emotionally, born and bred in peace, educated to hate war. They were overnight plunged into sudden and terrible situations. Every man has his breaking point, and these, in the fulfillment of their duties as soldiers, were forced beyond the limit of human endurance. On behalf of the commanding officer and his staff of Mason General Hospital, I want to extend a hearty welcome to all of you on your return to the United States. There's no need to be alarmed at the presence of these cameras as they're making a photographic record of your progress at this hospital from the date of admission to the date of discharge. Here are men who tremble, men who cannot sleep, Men with pains that are nonetheless real because they are of mental origin. Men who cannot remember. Paralyzed men whose paralysis is dictated by the mind. However different the symptoms, these things they have in common. Unceasing fear and apprehension. A sense of impending disaster. A feeling of hopelessness and utter isolation. The psychiatrists listen to the stories of the men who tell them as best they can. The names and places are different. The circumstances are different. But through all the stories runs one thread, death and the fear of death. And then after you got wounded, what happened? Same thing, only worse? Mm -hmm. Like my uh, nerves keep getting worse, so they get worse. These nerve things, they bone. Yeah. I got killed nearly from one. You nearly got killed. Where were you at the time? St. Louis, I believe. Somewhere else. Oh, I don't remember. And what, were you, what were you doing when the planes came over? I was in a hole. You know where you are? Well, I think I'm in the States now. They told me I was coming back. But they told me I was going to die. No. On the hospital, I wouldn't eat hardly. No, you're not. I was sick. And I wouldn't eat hardly until me. I was going to die, but I didn't eat. Couldn't help me. Well. Told me I didn't care where I died. I'm not. But we will see if you don't die. You won't die. Scout, and I was first scouting. They were all mixed up up there. They were shelling us. And well, did that make you nervous? I, I should have been first scout. I was first scouting. I should have been out in front. And he went out and I started to go out after him and he got shot. And yeah, he, he, he just said, oh, that's how I'm hitting. He crawled my feet. And, and I started calling for the medic. And I went back to see if we get the medic. And there wasn't any night. Like, Starting to go out after him again, and they wouldn't let me go. And he was the last one of the original boys that, that was with me. He was, him and I were the last two left and out of the original. And, that, and when you were shelled, how did you feel? I don't know. It's just after Norman got got hurt or killed, why 
uh, I was all right when we were moving up or attacked and anything like that. When we get pinned down, I start thinking about him laying back there. And, and what happens to you when you think about him? How would you feel? I just didn't care what happened to me. Do you mean you didn't want to go back into combat again? Yes, sir. I wanted to go back. I wanted to stay there. I wanted to keep on for him and all the other guys, Norm, or John, and Striker, and Tex, and Pop, and... And how do you feel right now? I feel all right. How have you been getting along? Well, fairly well, sir. Mm -hmm. New overseas. Yes, sir. Where? Uh, we were in France, and then we went to Germany. To where? France to Germany. And what uh, outfit were you with? I was with Headquarters Detachment, 5th Quartermaster Battalion, Mobile. Mm -hmm. I see your BFC at present. Mm -hmm. uh, you went ahead and go to the hospital. Sir? You had to go to the hospital. Twice, sir. It says here on your record from overseas that uh, you had headaches and that you had crying spells. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe that your profession is called nostalgia. In other words, homesickness. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It was induced when shortly before the war. I received a picture of my sweetheart. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't go to you. That's all right. Uh, come on, sit down a minute. Now, a display of emotion is all right. I'm not doing this deliberately. Of course you believe me. I, I do believe you. Um, a display of emotion is sometimes very helpful. I hope so, sir. Sure, it gets it off your chest. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have been returned. Uh, there was a patient. If there wasn't something upsetting you. Yes, sir. Well, Sorry. you say you had, had received a letter from your... Um, Not a letter, sir. A photograph. A photograph, yes. Well, what, what, what about that now? Well, sir, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm very much in love with my sweetheart. She has been the one person that gave me a sense of importance in that through her cooperation with me, we were able to surmount so many obstacles. What happened? Well, when I was in combat, when, uh, can you speak louder? I, I have yes, trouble hearing you. Uh, during the time, I got worried that my brother, he was killed on a canal. Oh, was he a Marine? Yes. Yeah. Now, I notice in this uh, history here that you saw a vision of your brother. What, uh, tell me something about that. What, what happened? Oh, I, I guess it was a dream. Well, describe the dream. What, what did you see in the dream? I, I dreamt that I was home. My brother was home. My other brother was home. We all were home. All of you were home? Sitting around the table. Everybody was happy. We were laughing, you know, talking. Mm -hmm. Just, admiring each other's and then it ended there. You That's can see it. these images clearly. Yeah, they it was like in a dream, see. Yeah. Uh, what about this Mindanao thing uh, you're telling me about? Well, I, in Mindanao, after I got that mood, I, I, I was, I admit I was scared. You were scared? I, I don't know, I, sometimes I, I hope something would happen then again, I say, well, Something did happen. What do you mean by something happened? You mean you were hoping that you'd be wounded and sent back? Is that what you mean? No. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean that I, I hoped that just, you know, I was so disgusted and tired of everything. I just didn't feel like living. And then I changed my mind and I think back to my folks and it'd be a double blow if something happened to me. And mm -hmm. I'd be standing with God sitting on a machine gun there and just watching. And I'd, I'd hear a little noise and I'd let go. Shoot, wasn't nothing, probably was an animal or something. Any noise made you excited, you just shoot? At that time, yes. Well, do you, you feel worried, worried about anything now? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Are you mixed up? Kind of. What's that uh, pin on your shirt then? 
my heart. Well, why do you cover those up? Aren't you proud of them? Yes, sir. You got a purple heart? And campaign ribbons? Yes, sir. Well, why do you cover them up? And you know, there must be some reason for you doing that. Well, what happened over there? Well, we got in the scrape and... Uh, I was in the house there and just got off the of guard duty and it was Friday the 13th and we were sweating it out all day and patrol came up from the German patrol and they, uh, they shot a, a, a panzer fuzz through a wall. And, well, in what? Uh, I, I was laying on the couch and right before it happened, I fell over Jerry's so stuff, laid down on the floor. And um, when, I, when I got up again, the couch was all torn. In other words, you were almost killed, was that it? Uh, I, yeah, it almost, it almost got right over my head. Do you feel conscious? Uh, is, are you aware of the fact that you are not the same boy that you were when you went over? Do you feel changed? How about with people? I used to. Hmm? I used to always like that fun now. I used to always be going places. I don't like them too much no more. How long were you overseas? Eleven months. Eleven months. Were you in any combat at all? This is six months ago. I tried uh, every every way to keep my mind occupied, reading, uh, going to the gymnasium, getting, uh, going out with the fellows and trying to, uh, try to uh, become an extrovert, trying to get out of myself. But uh, it seemed to me that I got worse and worse. And uh, after a while, I, uh, I developed, uh, after the fear of the Saturday, I, I started developing fears of different sorts. Did you ever have similar pains before you got married? Never in my life. Have you ever been nervous before you got married? No, sir. Never. I was a solid man. The sudden noises bother you particularly? I could just sh sh shake over a little bit, but not that bad. Well, I guess I just got tired of living, you put it that way. I had trouble sleeping, yes. I had a dreaming of combat, you know. I just took off because I... I see too much of my, my buddies gone, and, and I figure the next one was for me. A man can just stand so much up there, I see. Admission note, transfer diagnosis, anxiety, reaction, severe. Active symptoms in remission. On this, their first night back in the States, each man who is able may make a long-distance call without cost. After months and years of silence, familiar voices are heard once again. Then each man makes for himself a small home, which will be his for the eight or ten weeks to come. the darkness of the ward emerged the shapes born of darkness, the terror of things half remembered, dreams of battle, the torments of uncertainty and fear and loneliness. inspection. The medical officer in charge checks the condition of every man. Modern psychiatry makes no sharp division between the mind and the body. 
Physical ills often have psychic causes, just as emotional ills may have a physical basis. Possibilities of organic disturbance in the brain are investigated by means of the electroencephalograph. The Rorschach test, the things that the patient's imagination sees in these cards give significant clues to his personality makeup. This looks sort of like a drawing of two women standing on a rock and waving their hands. This man suffering from a conversion hysteria requires immediate treatment. Organically sound, his paralysis is as real as if it were caused by a spinal lesion. But it is purely psychological. Well, just sit him up in the middle of the bed there. That's fine. Now sit yourself over there. Well, now, can you move just a little so I can talk to you? Yes. Now, what is the trouble? What's that? That's a nervous. Nervous, I guess. Make me flinch I say, how long has that been going on? Since Friday. Friday? Friday night. Come on suddenly or gradually? Suddenly, sir. Oh. When I was starting the afternoon with clients, belts, mm -hmm. and I uh, felt something funny in my shoulders here, back by me. I just thought I'd cry. I wasn't sure my legs and my arms. Was there any reason for crying, spells? I don't know, sir. Mm -hmm. Anything <laughs> happened at home to bother you? Well, my mother's been ill. She has been ill. That's right. Does that worry you a lot? Quite a bit. Well, now, uh, has this got anything to do with your mother's illness? Any reason why you should have that kind of reaction? No, sir, not that I know of. Unless my mother's illness might have brought this on. I try to I hold him while it hurts. I see. You've just been holding these things in. That's right, sir. No way you can control this at all? No, sir. Well, now we're going to have to help you do that, of course. Let's take off this jacket here. Just slip that off. All right, now lie down on the bed. Right now we leave the shoes on so you can walk in them. I think we're going to get you walking. Let's come over here. That's the boy. That's fine. That's good. Now you lie steady. Lie steady. That's the boy. This is all going to go away as I give you this medicine. You don't bother at all. The method employed here is effective in certain types of acute cases. An intravenous injection of sodium amytal induces a state similar to hypnosis. What a torpedo that is. You might have found it this way. You look that way. Nothing for you to watch here, but you're going to talk to me as we go along. Yes, sir. That's all. Now, you're not going to feel much of anything else. You're going to feel a little bit woozy. The use of this drug serves a twofold purpose. Like hypnosis, it is a shortcut to the unconscious mind. As a surgeon probes for a bullet, the psychiatrist explores the submerged regions of the mind, attempting to locate and bring to the surface the emotional conflict which is the cause of the patient's distress. The second purpose of this drug is to remove, through suggestion, those symptoms which impede the patient's recovery. Now tell me a little bit about what you're thinking of. Their thoughts are coming to your mind now. Well, now let's go back. Let's go back to Friday. Friday? Yeah, I'll think about that. Friday. My mother argues with me. Your mother argues with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does she argue about? Well, every little thing. If you sit down in a long chair or something like that. Doesn't like the stuff you get in the store. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Then she comes down. Well, see, have you always tried to please her? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Always tried to please her. I used to clean her house for them as a small Well, now, why do you think she argues like that? Because she she's sick? Well, she doesn't try to control her temper. I see. Mm -hmm. How about your father? He's a swell guy. He's a swell fellow. He gets kind of mm -hmm. hot tempered. Since my mother's been sick, it's been costing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And he's lost a lot of weight about mm -hmm. worrying. I see. My mother argues with her and she wants to know where the money is. Mm -hmm. I don't care about that, as long as everything turns out all right. Well, now, uh, this jumping, what does that make you think of? Think about it a minute. Uh, I can't help it, it just jumps. Uh-huh. 
How about the legs? Do you know anybody who had any trouble with their legs like that? No, sir. Except, what did it make you think of? Go on. Except several, several years ago, uh -huh. there was one fella. He had something wrong with his right leg. Mm -hmm. Warming to me, but he's walking today. That hasn't bothered me. Was that me. anything like your leg? I don't know. He couldn't walk at all. Mm. He couldn't walk at all? No. What do you think of when you can't walk like that? I wish I could walk. Mm -hmm. but what do you think of? What comes to your mind when you mm -hmm. find that you can't walk? So maybe I think my mother and father should be okay. Sometimes I wonder, hope mm -hmm. the war ends soon. Things like that. I Nothing see. in particular. Mm -hmm. Now the shakes are going now, haven't they? Yeah. How about your legs? They're good and strong. Still all right. Move them. Let's raise them. Well, I don't see them raising before, but I can't walk. Well, how about them now? They feel all right. They feel good now, as if you can walk them, don't they? Toes feel numb. Toes feel numb, but that's going away, isn't it? Yeah. Gee. Mm -hmm. so raising them fine, isn't it? Yeah. Now you're going to be able to walk, aren't you? I don't know. Well, you're going to, aren't you? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to walk. I love walking. You love walking. I do. Always been very fond of walking. Now yes, you've found yourself unable to walk. Now you're going to get right up and walk. Right now. All right, now let's sit up. <laughs> sit up on the side of the bed. Here you are. That's fine. All right, now stand up. And look at that. That's good. All right, now walk out of here. Walk over to the nurse all by yourself. That's the boy. Walk over to the nurse, you're just a little woozy, that's medicine. Now come back to me. Come back to me. Open your eyes, that's the boy. Is that mine? Right? Isn't that wonderful? Sure. All right, now again, once more. Yeah, but I don't know what it would be. Oh, it's going to stay that way. It's going to stay because that's taking care of your worry now. All right, now come on back to me and I'm going to let you go to sleep. When you wake up, you'll keep on walking perfectly well. How about it? Thanks, sir. Right on. All right, now let's go up in here and we'll go to sleep. Now, there you go. Now, I'm going to have you go right to sleep. When you wake up, it'll be all right. All right, sleep. The fact that he can walk now does not mean that his neurosis has been cured. That will require time. But the way has been opened for the therapy to follow. Now, a new way of living begins very different from the old one whose purpose was killing and trying not to be killed. Now in an environment of peace and safety, all the violence behind them, they are building rather than destroying. Men have their choice of occupational therapy. Some find relaxation in mechanical jobs. Certain types of cases obtain relief in precision work, which answers their inner need for order and certainty. For sons and daughters and nieces and nephews and neighbors' kids, Hobby horses are turned out by the car load. Physical reconditioning is not the only purpose in sports which also serve to bring men out of their emotional isolation and back into group activity. One of the most important procedures is group psychotherapy. Here, under the psychiatrist's guidance, the patient learns to understand something of the basic causes of his distress. As one of a group, he also learns to understand that his inner conflicts are, with variations, common to all men. And I think of it a little bit like this. We want to get you out of your own feeling of isolation, to get you to feel that you are like other people. In order to get to that, we have to use Knowledge is one thing, and something else which uh, has to be added. And that is an experience of safety. You could say it is almost the core of all our treatment methods. Development of knowledge of oneself with the accompanying safety that it brings. I'd like to see if we can get some illustrations of how one's personal safety would stem from childhood safety and how the childhood safety self would stem from the parents safety uh, and my illustration uh, as a child uh, whenever I, I underwent any experiences that were frightening to me I never uh, told my parents I kept it to myself while I was alone at night in my room I'd go on guard if I had done anything wrong I was ashamed of I was ashamed to go to my parents and tell them 
what I had done. So I kept it to myself. And I used to, I know I used to be in constant fear that my parents would find out my feelings. Well, I wonder if there's any of your mother's troubles that you would know about. No, I'm, uh, my mother never uh, gave any of the children any, any part of her troubles. Well, that would be the same thing that happened to you. She didn't tell her troubles, and you didn't tell yours. You took your troubles to God, and she probably did the same thing, probably didn't even confide in your father. In other words, the kind of method that you used to get relief from anxiety was really, we'd have to assume, learned and felt right in your home, and the same kind of thing. I think it was all caused by uh, economic conditions of you know, the world. I mean, uh, people trying to comp uh, compete one another, trying to get a better job, trying to keep up with the uh, uprising, living things like that, of course, a lot of uh, arguments in the home. Mother and father arguing about the uh, price of the food, and that has a reflection on the children. Right. Like that. So I think that was one of the causes of the children. Not having enough food to eat or the arguments between well, the both. mother. I mean, uh, there was... Well, which was the worst, though? Well, I guess the arguments. Sure, they, of course they are. Because I can't remember about the food. <laughs> there you are. You can't even remember about the food or the lack of food. I have in mind my own childhood. We're uh, coming from a moderate family. Moderate in the sense that uh, the family had some sense of security. What happened there was we were told that uh, we, I mean my, myself, my brothers and sisters, we couldn't just play with any of the kids we wanted to play with. Uh, unless their parents in turn had the equivalent of what our parents had. And as a result, we were kept in a narrow circle, very, very narrow. However, uh, I have found that there has been a strong yearning on my part to break out of this environment, to be able to uh, play with Tom that can have. I'd say the net results like this. Your mother did not feel really so superior she felt inferior when she tried to make you take the attitude you were better than the other children. So that now, in certain experiences in the Army, have brought that out more clearly because you've been thrown in with Tom and Dick and Harry and need to get along with them. It's not necessary to be in the Army. It's not necessary to, to be in the war. These kind of troubles have always gone on in all time, through all the centuries. So you're going to say something. I never spoke until I was seven. Is that right? Yes, sir. And I studied very bad. At 14 and 15, I couldn't recite in school. <coughs> Can you explain how you got started to talk? How you began to get over that? Uh, during, during the war, the first word I ever spoke, um, Santa Claus had brought me a, a war gun. And my brother broke it. This is the first World War, yes? And so on. Uh, <laughs> when I went in to get my gun, I was, I just, just walked in. Somebody broke my gun. That was the first thing I said. You were angry because someone broke your gun. That's so right. that's where I started talking. I would say all those symptoms, like being unable to speak, stuttering and so on, they have an underlying anger and resentment in the deeper parts of the personality. You could almost say it like this. Underneath I can't, you usually find I won't. I was on uh, Okinawa, I was stuttering too, about three weeks. And uh, as soon as I came here, in here a month now, I stopped stuttering. You've stopped stuttering completely since you came here? Yes, sir. Well, that's good. I don't know whether that's a tribute to the doctors or a tribute to your fundamental health. It's my fundamental self. <coughs> No, no tribute to the doctors at all. Very good. <laughs> Some patients require special therapy. Hypnosis is often effective in certain types of battle neuroses, such as amnesia. This man does not even remember his own name. A shell burst in Okinawa wiped out his memory. The experience was unendurable to his conscious mind, which rejected it, and along with it his entire past. Through hypnotic suggestion, the psychiatrist will attempt to evoke them. Relax completely and uh, put your mind on going to sleep. All right, now keep your eyes on mine. Keep your eyes on mine and keep them fixed on mine. Keep your mind entirely on falling asleep. You're going to go into a deep sleep as we go on. 
You're going to go into a deep sleep as we go in. Now clasp your hands in front of you. Clasp them tight, 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 tight. They're getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and as they get tighter, you're falling asleep. As they get tighter, you're falling asleep. Your eyes are getting heavy, heavy. Now your hands are locked tight. They're locked tight. They're locked tight. You can't let go. They're locked tight. You can't let go. When I snap my fingers, you'll be able to let go. When I snap my finger, you'll be able to let go, and then you'll get sleepier, and your eyes are getting heavier. Now your eyes are getting heavier, heavier, heavier. You're going into a deep, deep sleep. You're going into a deep, deep sleep. Deep asleep, far asleep. Eyes now closed tight, closed tight. Going to a deep, deep sleep. Deeply relaxed, far asleep. You're far asleep. You're far asleep. Now you're in a deep sleep. You have no fear, no anxiety. No fear, no anxiety. Now you're in a deep, deep sleep. Now just sit down in the chair behind you. Sit down in the chair behind you. Lean back. Head now falls forward into a deep, deep sleep. Head now is falling forward, going further and further and further asleep. And I stroke your left arm, become rigid like a bar of steel, and you go further asleep and further asleep. Falling further and further and further asleep. Rigid. Cannot be bent or relaxed. When I touch the top of your head, when I touch the top of your head, that arm will relax and the other will become rigid. And you'll go further asleep. You'll be in a very deep sleep. And your sleep is deeper and deeper. Now when I touch this hand, my finger will be hot. When I touch this hand, my finger will be hot. You will not be able to bear it. Your arm is rigid. And now that I touch your hand, you will no longer feel any pain there. It will be normal. Now the arm is relaxed and you're further and further and further asleep. Now you're deep asleep. We're going back. We're going back now. We're going back to Okinawa. We're going back to Okinawa. You can talk. You can talk. You can remember everything. You can remember everything. You're back on Okinawa. Tell me what you see. Tell me. Speak. You're in the battery area. Go on, tell me what's going on. Getting fire missions. You're getting fire missions. Go on. If you see everything now, clearly. Getting shells thrown at us. You're getting shells thrown at him. From where? Japs. Japs. Go on. Yes. Keep on. You remember it all now. Every bit of it's coming back. Japs getting near us to get our position. Jeff's getting near you to get your position. Go on. Get cover. Who told you to get cover? BC. BC. Go on. There's five of us. One of the boys got hurt. One of the boys got hurt. Take him away. I was on there with my gun position. Yes, go on. You remember it now. Tell me. It's all right now, but you can tell me. You can tell me. Explosion? Yes. You remember the explosion now. All right, go on. They're carrying me. They're carrying you. Who's carrying you? Uh, Where are they taking you? Carrying me across the field. Across the field? Go on. Put me in a stretch. Yes? Yes? Go on. There's no throwing shaft. Yes? Can you hear them? Yes. You see them? No. All right. Where are they taking you now? In a truck. Hmm? Why are you fearful now? I want to move it. You don't want any more. You want to forget it. But you're going to remember it because it's gone now. It's gone. You're back here now. You're away from Okinawa. You've forgotten it. But you remember who you are now. Who are you? That's right. 
Full ring now. That's right. Hmm? You know your mother's name? Isabel. That's right. Father's? So, uh, That's fine. You know who they all are now. All right, now you're coming back with us. This is going to stay with you. You're going to remember it all. You're going to remember about Okinawa. You're going to remember about the shells and the bombs, but they're gone. At ease and relaxed. There's no fear, no anxiety. When I wake you up, you'll be comfortable, relaxed, no pains and no aches. But you'll remember all that I've told you. All that you've remembered. You can wake now. Well, how are you? Pretty <clears> good. <throat> Under the guidance of the psychiatrist, he is able to regard his experience in its true perspective as a thing of the past, which no longer threatens his safety. Now he can remember. Well, what's your trouble? This man is not a chronic stutterer. He suffers from a battle tension which the drug will attempt to diminish. Like the man who could not walk and the man who could not remember, his illness has an emotional basis. We're all comfortable now and relaxed. We're just going to give you some medicine here and it's going to help limber up that tune of yours. And this is going to make you feel a bit groggy. Side of the ship. 
besides that? That would be the left side. Left side, that's right. Yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. Of course, we were up there that afternoon, and we saw the fishes. And we had some flying fishes. I came down, and he said, I was telling the fellow underneath me about the ports that I had seen some flying fishes on the port side. Mm -hmm. He tried telling them about the flying fishes, and he stumbled over the S sound. And the fellows laughed at him. Think hard. S. S. What does S remind him of? S. S. He remembers. It is the sound he fears. The sound of death in combat. The sound of a German 88 high explosive shell coming in. Now it is possible to proceed to the basic method of psychiatric treatment discussion and understanding of the underlying causes of his symptom. As the weeks pass, the therapy begins to show its effect. The shock and stress of war are starting to wear off. For these men are blessed with the natural regenerative powers of youth. Now they are living less in the past and more in the present. Sometimes they think of the future. The war years must be put aside and the responsibilities of peace must be considered. A man might open a filling station or a hardware store or he can buy a few acres of land and raise some chickens. He might even go back to school. Visitor's Day. Now the men resume their contact with the world outside. These are the people they are coming back to, whose lives are bound up with theirs. Without their understanding, all that has been accomplished in the last few weeks can be torn down. With it, their return to life can be doubly swift and sure. Classes in group psychotherapy continue. The men are thinking of themselves in relation to society. How will they fit into the post-war pattern? How will the world receive them? Uh, you fellows have had a, an opportunity to be home with your family since you've returned from overseas. Have you noticed any change in the various members of your family toward you, in the reactions toward you? Well, I found out after four years of absence that it only took me the second day to be really relaxed. And I was late chummy again with my dad. Um, talked about the old neighborhood and the new changes. I, I don't know, it surprised me. You feel that your family has to be taught how to treat you when you come back? No, absolutely not. How do you want to be treated by family? The same uh, I was treated before I went to the service. No different. You don't yeah. want to be treated yeah. any differently? No. I was talking to one uh, man and uh, I said, what do you uh, think of us fellows that come back with psych neurosis anxiety state? And I said, you can see that we're not uh, crazy by any means. And he says, well, my, before I come out here to see, he says, uh, my first impression was like in Bellevue. He said, fellas from the last war, they're completely maniacs. He said, that was my first impression. So I'm wondering if, uh, I mean, uh, the great percentage of the people are going to be like that when we get out. That, that is a common concern among the servicemen who have developed nervous conditions during their stay in the Army, uh, as to what the public is going to think about them. Undoubtedly, there will be people on the outside who won't have any understanding of the condition, who may think of it as being a rather shameful condition. That's why we're having an educational program, trying to educate the public into understanding. Unfortunately, most of you fellows have gone through some very severe stresses in the Army. Uh, stresses that civilians are rarely subjected to. In civilian life, you can avoid serious stresses. If a civilian, the average civilian, were subjected to similar stresses, he undoubtedly would have developed the same type of nervous condition that most of you fellows developed. All of us have our so-called breaking point. And a survey outside showed that civilians, on the whole, were more nervous than soldiers. On Park Avenue, for instance, 
where some of your richest people live, <laughs> most, most of the patients are people who suffer from nervous disorders, and if the doctor won't give them a pill, why, they'll go out and say, well, he's not a good doctor. So therefore, they're given pills, and they take them at home. They take these pills at home because the hospitals are too full. If the hospitals were empty, they'd be in a sanitarium or so forth. Having uh, been through none of these discussions, like the other men have, I know that we have uh, learned uh, the basis of how we've gotten nervous, some of us uh, through combat, and some of us by not being in combat. And I think, and I'm sure that we have a better understanding of our conditions, and uh, I'm pretty grateful of being here at Mason General Hospital, like a lot of folks are. I just so happened that I couldn't walk, and they made me walk. I couldn't walk when I arrived, and I was here 24 hours and made me walk. I feel pretty grateful for getting my limbs back. But that is my drive on that. It's that uh, I know that uh, when I get out of here, and the other fellows do too, we're going to try our best to make ourselves uh, as best we can. And uh, we feel more confident in the, the, the grasp of the nervous situation that's come about us. And we want to show people that we can do things on our own on the outside. Whether we've been in the hospital for nervous or mental or wherever we've been, whether we lost mom or away, that we can be just as good as anybody else. All I want is that they give us a chance to prove our uh, equality, like they said they were. I hope they keep their promise. That's all I hope. Would you make it a point to tell your employer that you were a psychoneurotic? Well, if he's uh, an intelligent man, which most well-known employers are that own large concerns, why, he's going to react the same as any other normal human being would. He's going to say it's absolutely possible. And the man right now looks all right. I'll try him out. But uh, you may run into employers who are not that broad-minded or intelligent. Yes, sir. And I'll sell myself to them. How about you? Do you have any plans about jobs? Or do you have any fears about getting a job? Or oh, what's the uh, government job waiting for you? You have your job waiting for you. I think it comes down to this, doesn't it? That uh, both of you fellows feel that you ought to be honest with your employer, that you have nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of. Isn't that the general attitude? Yes, sir. That's what we all know. Your time in the service was not entirely wasted. You have learned a great deal in the service. For instance, a great many jobs and tasks that you have learned to do in the service that you have had absolutely no contact with in the past. You've also learned to work in groups, uh, something that every soldier learns to do very early in his military career. This definitely will be of much value to you in your future civilian employment. have slipped by fast. The first strangeness of hospital life has become routine. Sometimes a man learns something new. The ranger always did want to play guitar. putting some ice cream in the ice cream soda. No longer is a man shut up within the lonely recesses of himself. He is breaking out of his prison into life. The life that lies ahead, offering infinite possibilities for happiness and sorrow. How does a man find happiness? Is there a secret to discover? What is the mysterious ingredient that gives joy and meaning to living? You know in the Bible where it says, man does not live by bread alone. Children don't grow up well without safety and confidence. If that wasn't in one's childhood, in growing up, you could say, now there's something missing during all that time. And the next question is, how to supply it? 
and it does need to be supplied. Not all of the learning and all of the books is half as valuable in getting over nervousness as to find someone that you esteem, that you can learn to feel safe with, where you can get a feeling of being accepted, of cherished, where you get a feeling that you are worthwhile and that you are important to someone. You could say, the feeling that you didn't get, that's something more than bread, when you were little, you still need to get it. You still need to be fed an acceptance and to find the safety. In other words, knowledge alone is not enough. Eight weeks have passed. What about these men? Are they ready for discharge? How complete is their recovery? How about the boy in White Field? I just didn't care what happened to me. How about the kid at bat? Boxo was covered by dirt. I was covered up for 29 hours afterwards until it found me. Returning to your homes, your families, and friends. Many of you have been looking forward eagerly to this day. But remember, when you re enter civilian life, on your shoulders falls much of the responsibility for the post war world. May your lives as civilians be as worthy as your records as soldiers. Good health, good fortune, and Godspeed.
of these cameras as they're making a photographic record of your progress at this hospital from the date of admission to the date of discharge. Here are men who tremble, men who cannot sleep, men with pains that are nonetheless real because they are of mental origin, men who cannot remember, paralyzed men whose paralysis is dictated by the mind. However different the symptoms, these things they have in common, unceasing fear and apprehension, a sense of impending disaster, a feeling of hopelessness and utter isolation. psychoneurotic soldier. These are the casualties of the spirit, the troubled in mind, men who are damaged emotionally. Born and bred in peace, educated to hate war, they were overnight plunged into sudden and terrible situations. Every man has his breaking point, and these, in the fulfillment of their duties as soldiers, were forced beyond the limit of human endurance. Good evening, men. On behalf of the commanding officer and his staff of Mason General Hospital, I want to extend a hearty welcome to all of you on your return to the United States. There's no need to be alarmed. The psychiatrists listen to the stories of the men who tell them as best they can. The names and places are different. The circumstances are different. But through all the stories runs one thread, death and the fear of death. And then after you get wounded, what happens? Anything only worse? Um, like my uh, nerves keep getting worse, so mm -hmm. they get worse. These nerve things, they burn. Yeah. I got killed nearly the morning. You nearly got killed. Where were you at the time? St. Laurel, I believe. Somewhere else. Oh, no. I don't remember. And what, were you, what were you doing when the planes came over? I was in a hole. You know where you are? Well, I had the same in the States now. They told me I was coming back. But they told me I was going to die. No. I'm in the hospital. I wouldn't eat hardly. No, if I was sick, no, I wouldn't eat hardly. They told me I was going to die, but I didn't eat. Couldn't help me. Yeah. Told me I didn't care where I died or not. We will see if you don't die. You won't die. Oh, I 
Cosmo, the last buddy up there, little Norman, he was second scout. I was first scout. And they were all mixed up up there. They were shelling us. And well, did that make you nervous? I, I should have been first scout. I was first scout, and I should have been out in front. And he went out, and I started to go out after him, and he got shot. And yeah, he, he, he just said, oh, that's how I'm hitting me, crawled my feet. And, and 